Hi, hello, hey, and welcome to Rushed Vibes. I am Jessica Rushed Vibes Rushing, accompanied by David Rushed Vibes Rushing. And we are here for a special episode. First, we guess our first uh, location. episode on, on location. Okay. We're on location, and he writes for a special reason. So um, not only is this our first episode on location, it's our first political interview. It is. We got a politician up here. We are legit. So uh, joined by former Monroe City Councilman, Franco McGee, who is running again for yes. city council. Um, also the recipient uh, Man of the Year Award by A Few Good Men in year 2022. So that was, that was last year. Uh, staple in the city, 16 year city employee um, from the area, from graduated from Monroe High School. So Union County, born and bred. Um, and yeah, so Franco said he was thinking about running again on uh, the upcoming election and he said, I want to come on Rush Vibes. He was supposed to come on last year, but then he stood us up that one time. Oh, yeah. So um, he said he wanted to, to come on again. So I said, well, let's make, it happen. let's make it happen. So here we are in the beautiful city of Monroe, downtown Monroe. Yes. Across from the uh, the skyscrapers. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Such a pleasure. Um, I look forward to the deep conversation. Yeah. So, um, I'm just going to jump right in. Are you, you cool with me jumping right in? Because I got the, I got the light cross, which means we're serious. Okay, you're ready. Um, I'm sorry. Can you, can you have me? I'm good. Go okay. Jump. Um, so running again. Yes. The city council. Um, you were elected first in 2017. Was. Right. Mm -hmm. you, served, that was, uh, you served one term. Um, what was it about city council uh, that made you say that's something I want to run for? Like that's that's my position that's for me <clears throat> well i felt like that was the next step right um i'm um, sorry pull your mic just a little bit closer i feel like that there was the go. next step uh so like you said born and bred in monroe union county um just always been a big community guy right and so i felt like after working for the city for 16 years um and kind of knowing the ins and outs of the logistics of the city um, you know, I felt like there were some things that needed to be adjusted, some some changes that needed to be made. And so I felt like it was my responsibility having that knowledge to kind of level up, right? And I felt like the only way for me to do that and to impact change was to run for council. Um, so that was kind of my thinking at first. And no, I'm not a politician. I never consider myself to be a politician. I'd rather be um, represented as an elected leader. Mm. Um, cause I know politicians kind of have a negative connotation. So I've always advocated for the voiceless, um, and really tried to impact change wherever I was. Um, and so, yeah, so city council was, what's the next thing in sight. Okay. Um, what do you, what, what kind of prepared you to run for, to be in a leadership position? Like <clears throat> what are some of the, some of the experiences you've had, some of the positions you've had? Interesting question. So when I was, I, when I was awarded the Citizen of the Year Award for A Few Good Men, I really kind of had to think about, like, how did I get here? And I and it came to me that leadership was always a part of my family, my community. Um, having coached basketball at Parkwood, of course, for about 20-something years, having an opportunity to coach you, Russ. How um, was that, by the way? I was thinking, it, was, it, was, it was a great experience, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. it, was, it was a fantastic it was, experience. It was a lo lovely experience, really, so... Coaching basketball, I was actually um, Parks and Rec Center supervisor for about 10 years. Um, you know, my family's very community-oriented. My mom would actually make uh, meals and take them around to people who needed them in the community. Uh, my aunt, <clears throat> um, back in the early 90s, um, started a Marlin kind of troop to help like um underserved children like girls mm -hmm. mostly yeah. um to help improve body imaging you know just stuff like that just really kind of i guess propelled me and really motivated me to kind of do my part and i feel like my part after coaching after working for the city um having the lineage that i have was to run for council and i felt like leadership is just something that i feel like is innate it's just something that was just in our dna and i feel, feel like i needed to kind of go ahead and exercise that 
You got anything? I do. I see you thinking. No, I, saw the, thinking. I saw the smoke coming. So, what... I'm not very political. So, you know, I know titles. I know <clears throat> roles. But I don't necessarily... I don't want to say understand, but I'll use understand sure. what exactly specific jobs do. So being a city councilman, what what does that allow you to do? What right. what impact can you actually have in terms of like is it legislation or Sure, thanks. Animals? Good question, because you know that's that's most of us. A lot of times people really don't understand what it means to be a politician, if you will, or a city council member. So I try to explain it like this. Um, we are the people locally on the grassroots level who has an opportunity to really impact your household. And I, and I say that a lot because I feel like people can't connect the dots. So when I say that, you know, you know people want to complain about, you know, utility bills or maybe not having um, accessible parks or, um, you know, or water, water fountains in their parks or just um, opportunities for their kids to kind of just do things outside. But I just try to explain it to people like I am the guy. First of all, I let people know that I work for them because people don't understand the dynamics and how it works. So it's really um, elected, elected officials, um, well, the people elected officials, and then the governing entity. So, um, so we report to the people per se, and then the city staff reports to us. More importantly, more specifically, the city staff report reports to the city manager and the city manager reports to us. So that's kind of how the organization is constructed um, with the city. So to answer your question, it's more about just me wanting to educate people on the process, how to get engaged, what it looks like, um, and things of that nature. So, yeah. So Sorry, it's just, it's just, it's just, you know, I, I, just, I know I, I just want to take an opportunity because, you know, Jessica's really abusive. <laughs> so, you know, this yeah, is this is just this is just it on a smaller scale. Like at home, she'd be like wild okay. hitting with the rock bottom, hey, stone cold stunners. You know, I gotta hey, get my hands checked. People gotta do what they gotta do, you know. Hey. You're sitting here minding my own business. You, you just struck me. It's a fly. Some, some childhood trauma she's working through. Hey, so it's a fly. yeah, we're gonna we're gonna I'm here to help. <laughs> get that worked out. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You were being serious. I'm just messing around. So, in regards to the role of city councilman, one might ask why, and one being me, uh, why not mayor? Why not city manager? Why? Why or is there a track? Like, is there a trajectory that we're trying to go to get there? Am I like letting the cat out the bag? I'll stop. No, no, you're good. That's a good question. Um, so city council, so in our city council, so there are different roles of city council. Um, and our city council, our form of government is um, council manager, meaning that the manager reports to us. So the mayor is actually just one of our council members. Yeah, he ma he makes decisions, but at the end of the day, he has one vote, just like I would have one vote. Okay. So it's not really a, mm, I guess it's figurehead. He's the mayor, but really when it comes to voting, they only have one vote. Okay. So in our council, we have seven council members, um, including the mayor. So that's how that vote would go. So at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter per se if you're the mayor or not kind of so the mayor does you know figure ahead they do other things and and also they kind of impact some change but at the end of the day they can't do it unless they have the consensus of the council right, right? because you got to have that four three or so the mayor can't make any unilateral no decisions essentially no, not okay. typically no and that's and that's a safeguard, right? Yeah. So we can make sure that people aren't using their positions to make decisions for a whole city. So it's actually a good thing that they can't. So they can do some things, but not yeah. things. Good old checks and balances. Got it. Yeah. Um, I I've, we kind of went a little out of order, but I would love to know just about Monroe. Okay. From you and okay. and the sentimental and and just like because. Born and bred, born and bred here right. in high school. I mean, you're, you're Monroe. Um, so I just love to like what if you're talking to someone who is not from Monroe, who has not experienced True. Monroe. How do you tell them about your hometown? Right. Um. So 
my story. So I like to tell people, you know, I'm, I'm just a little kid. I grew up in Oxmoor Lee, uh, not the best community, um, single family. My mom raised me, um, went to Bitten Heights Elementary School, Monroe Middle School, Monroe High School, uh, North Carolina State. I came back here um, because I really believe in family and community. And I wanted to, I'm not sure, and really, to be honest, I never wanted to be an elected official. That was nothing that I kind of set my sights to be. I just wanted to um, be the best version of myself. And so um, understanding, you know, kind of what my family, who my family is and what we've done. I mean, my uncle, um, great athlete in Union County, um, big community guy in the church and sports. And like I said, my mom and grandmother and everybody just, we just always been very family oriented. So community is very, very critical, a very crucial um, part of my life. And so I wanted to make sure that I was, um, kind of living that out through everything that I did to let people know who I am and, and what I stand for. Uh, so first and foremost, I am a man who is about my community, who is about my family. And so to kind of put that on a grander scale. So in my leadership, you know, I kind of had deemed myself to be this community council member because that's what I focused on. My focus was always to make sure that the community understood who I am and what, I was here for it. And I feel like I'm here to really help the community to move forward, um, to really give them access and educate them on the processes that you were just currently asking about, because a lot of us really don't know how it works. They really don't know what local government is about. Mm -hmm. So my main um, point when I was first selected was really try to educate people on being engaged because the numbers are terrible when it comes to voting. Um, real quick, I gave you some numbers. So in 2021, out of 8,336 registered men voters, um, only 17, about 1,800 of them, no, actually it's about 1,400 of them voted. And out of that number, about 300 of them were black, about 1,200 of them were white, and about 16 to 15 of them were Hispanic. On the other side of that, on the women's side, about... Um, 10,174 registered voters, um, about 17, 1800 of them were white women, um, about, I think 700 of them are black women voters and about 20 something of them were Hispanic women. Mm. Those numbers are ridiculous. So out of about 35, 40,000 people in Monroe, we only have about 15% of them participating in the process. Mm. So when you think about that <clears throat> and, and as a people and trying to understand the gravity of, you really have about 15% of people making the decisions of how our community is going to be organized and going to be managed. And so I put those numbers out there to people on social media about two weeks ago, just to kind of maybe inspire them to want to get, in, get involved in the process because this is a participating process and you have to be engaged in it if you want to see the change. And so if you don't want to see the change, that's fine, but get involved in the process, right? We cannot be governed by only a few people when there's so many things and so many lives are impacted in what we do on the day to day. Why do you think turnout so low? Um, I think people have kind of given up on politics. Um, and so I really try to educate people on what leadership is and what that means to a community and try to give them an opportunity to kind of own their responsibility in that. Right. Just like I said before, we work for the people. Right. And so if the people aren't challenging us or holding the elected leaders accountable, then whose fault is that? And mm -hmm. so when you have a city that may not look like you or may not have the representation that you feel like we need, then you have to do your part. And your part is simply going on election day and just checking a box. Mm -hmm. I have signed up to do the work. Let me do the work. I'm okay with that, but at least get out there and vote. And so when I try to explain to people that everybody has responsibility, whether you are upset about gun violence, where you are upset about your, you know, the tax valuations in your community or whether you are upset about, you know, policing or 
the, the lack thereof or the over-policing or whatever, the infrastructure. You have to make that known by going to check that box or attending a meeting and coming to explain like, hey, your point of view, because at the end of the day, we are responsible. Council members are responsible for the way that you feel like our city is being run because it's our responsibility to make sure that we we do that in a, in, in a way in which we impact the people or make sure that the people are okay with what we're doing. Because at the end of the day, we are servant leaders who are serving the people. And I think a lot of times we have some leaders who get that twisted in a way where they feel like it's all about the leaders and it's not about the people. Mm. And I am first to tell people that it's about you first and we are here to serve you. So, so I'm a little bit different in that regard because I really empower people to make sure they understand that dynamic while some, uh, some other elected leaders may want people to understand that it's about the leadership and not about the people. So I'm kind of different in that regard. So being a city councilman, who's from here this is this is your your town what's the culture what's monroe's culture what is i have very limited experience with mm. monroe it's usually coming in dropping off children and leaving but right. <laughs> speed speeding away speed speed drop them off. Yeah. but 85 I, we out I really experienced mm -hmm. so what what is what makes this place special like i know david used to talk about how um this is the color purple it was, from, here? it was from the Union County. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, oh, Union County, not specifically Monroe. Some parts here, okay. Monroe, but yeah, I don't see. I had a family member who was yeah. an I, extra. Um, so I know about that, but that seems to be the only thing that ever gets referenced. So I'd love to know, you know, what is Monroe's culture? What what is the appeal? Um, especially me being a big city girl, like mm -hmm. every like I always wonder about small towns and what sure. what keeps people. Sure. So there's got to be something special that keeps sure. people, that's kept you. You went to Raleigh um, for school, right. so right. Um, so this is my home, and so um, and I just felt like it was an obligation for me, and I'm trying to kind of deal with that, but. I really wanted to kind of change how people saw Monroe because you're right. A lot of people see it as, Oh, you just, this old country town. It's not much going on. Why you stay in Monroe? Why you don't live in Charlotte? I was like, well, because it's my city. And what I would love to do and what I have been a part of is to change how Monroe is seen. I mean, if you look around here, downtown Monroe, I worked for the downtown for about seven years before I became a council member. So I was a part of that implementing our whole downtown master plan to assure that we pull we get university students up here to have things that were attractive of them, uh, making sure that we have things to make it attractive for the people that live here. Because I live in Monroe, but I drive to Charlotte a lot to do things because of the lack of the things that we have here in Monroe. And I don't mind doing that, but I would love for that to be afforded here. So, um, you know, the social district, you know, just having that done i'm not sure if you're familiar so basically that's when you're able to have drinks um, alcoholic beverages kind of to walk in these uh radi radii of the community so um that was something that i noticed that Canapolis had done in their re revitalization i was like hey guys if Canapolis is doing this hey we need to implement implement it here because what that does it also is a draw for more businesses for more breweries, for more bars who want to come here. Because if see if we have that opportunity here, then people can come and drink and kind of hang out throughout the downtown. So just making sure that we are a vibrant town, uh, making sure that we are aware that we do need to make ourselves attractive for a younger demographic um, and make sure that we are um, appealing to the whole family. Because not all people like to do those things, but we do have people here who who enjoy going out and hanging out and having things to do. Because I want to make one real place where you can work, play, and live, um, and dine, all the things that other cities offer. So we just have a lot of work to do to make sure that's something that, that, that we also um, can attract and can obtain here as well. So there is or isn't a social district? We do have one. Do you have one? Mm -hmm. Since when? Um, probably about... Let me see, what are we, 2023? Probably since um, about two years. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have to come to so sure they got one before. Um, yeah, we've got a couple of brewers around here too, man. So, you know, it's, 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 things are changing. That's cool. Yeah, and that's it's not always popular. So there's pushback for that too, believe it or not. So, yeah, so, so the, the issue, not issue, the challenge that 
you know, I find here in Monroe is that balance of where people want the change and people want the new things. And then some people are like, no, I want things to stay the way it is. And so that's the whole big kind of uh, process to kind of really work through, kind of working through um, people that have been here all their lives as well, you know, but not really wanting to kind of see Monroe evolve yeah. to the city that it can be. And so I'm a, I'm a person, the change is going to come. Charlotte is really pushing us every day, but I feel like it's our responsibility to make sure that we plan that and we, and we have strategies to make sure that we do it in the right way. So the growth is going to come, but how are we preparing for it? You know, are we just going to sit here on our hands and just hope it doesn't come because it's going to come. It's inevitable, but we can also be on the proactive part of that and making sure that we are involved in that process and setting things in motion to make sure that we are prepared for it when it happens. So you talked about the social district. Did you have, did you play a role in that getting implemented? Well, yes, I did. Okay. I saw it. And so I spoke to the city manager. So we talked about the dynamics. So I suggested it in a meeting that we implement this process. And so um, I was told that it was already being done by the downtown director, which mm -hmm. was good. Um, but I did bring it up in a meeting that we should consider um, having a social district to to support the businesses down here the bars and the breweries that we do have there and also to encourage others to come as well so mm -hmm. and what's just out of general curiosity what's like a high level overview of the process from i have this idea i want this to be implemented and getting it to like the social district like what, like council yeah so like how how would that from inception to Good implementation question. so the way that we, the way that our council is set up, so typically you got to have two. So if you have two council members to suggest or to add something to an itinerary, right? And so we add something to an itinerary, it gets discussed in our meetings. Uh, so we typically have two council members who have to do that. If not, one of the things, the benefits of being married, you can just put things on the agenda without having anybody else to kind of say, hey, we want to do that. So how mm -hmm. we've done it in the past is that if you have two council members that want to add something to the agenda, we can do it. Or if the mayor will want to add it on there so we can do it. So after the, after we do that, we meet about it, we talk about it, we discuss it, we have the people that it pertains to, the department that it pertains to, they present it to the council. If everybody's good with it, we, we decide that's something that we want to move forward with and we do it. Um, so we vote and then we decide, hey, if, if we have at least four that say, okay, then to get moved forward mm -hmm. what, what kind of uh budgetary um uh do you have to mind is there like a certain budget you guys have to work within like do you, do you have to like estimate what something gonna cost oh, absolutely do you yeah. have to like how does that so we the budget scene is always in july so it's a budget over the whole city so yes yeah, so council that's one of our big responsibilities to make sure that the budget is balanced and so that's all from from uh wages to programming mm -hmm. um so that's always a big issue so what happens is typically cities make money in a couple of ways we make money through taxes and we make money through um like utilities like any type of uh, services that we provide and so that's those are the ways that we incur money so if we do not have enough money that's coming in then we have to raise taxes mm -hmm. and so and that's typically like a big thing. Nobody wants to raise taxes. But right. my thing is, for instance, we were in the process of getting a new police station that I'm not, I'm not sure if did y'all see the new police station. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's, we just opened that up um, a few weeks ago. Um, and so that idea kept getting kicked down the road about us moving forward with us getting that open and getting that done and starting that mm -hmm. process to kind of move because the police station is really across the street and because there was no space. So the space was there, you know, they didn't really have enough space to be really effective in what they were doing. So in a meeting, it was a strategic planning meeting. I, um, I just kind of asked the question, like, so what, do, why, why do we keep kicking this down the road? Do we, or do we not need a, a new facility? And so they really couldn't answer that question. So it was more about, um, I felt like 
Mono has this conservative kind of notion of where we always need to kind of save money. But my thing was with that is if we have it in the budget, then why aren't we doing it? Um, so I'm not a person that just wants to hoard up money. I want to make sure that we provide the services that our community needs. And I felt like there was a need for that because, first of all, they ran out of space. And I felt like having a brand new police station would, would say something to our community mm. that we believe in policing. And also... My point to all of that was that if people understood why we're raising taxes, if we needed to raise taxes to afford this police station, then I feel like people would be okay with that. And it wouldn't be this big outlandish increase, but something very minimum to say, hey, we're going to raise our taxes maybe 2% to afford us to be able to have this police station. I feel like if we can kind of let people know the whys, I feel like people would be okay with the, with the notion. How did, how did the community receive it? I'm sorry. How did the community receive the police station? They did. They received it very well. Um, yeah, they received it very well. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a new, it's something new that we needed, and, um, and most mostly received it very well. Um, so, what are some of the uh, highlights of your of your tenure? When you were when you were elected, um, you first started in, in 2017. So the the most, you did. The my most proudest moment was when I was able to uh, make Juneteenth a Bay holiday. So in the wake of George Floyd, um, so we were in a meeting. <laughs> we we're in a meeting, and um, it was it's, it was in December because we were about to um, announce the new calendar that we would be using the new holiday calendar that we will use for the next upcoming year. So what we do, we always improve the calendar in every, at, in every year. So, and this was not planned. This is not scripted. So in that process, um, when they were talking about the new calendar, so I was like, Hey guys, I have something. So I really talked about the fact that um, I felt like it was our responsibility through an opportunity to bridge the gaps, to show that we are inclusive, um, that we were diverse in our thinking and our, and our programming and in our policies that we implement the holiday of Juneteenth. And so I explained what that really meant. How many people asked you? <laughs> what you see? I'm sorry, my bad. No, it's fine. I, I mean, you know what, during, during the time, um, nobody asked. So, um, and you know, man, and during that meeting, um, it passed unanimously and I was kind of stunned and shocked, but, and the, another reason why I was stunned and shocked because we were the first to do that in our area. Charlotte hadn't done it. You know, at the time it wasn't a North Carolina, um, um, law or holiday. Um, so it was a big deal. Like nobody had even done that here locally or in the area, in this metropolitan area. So it was a huge moment for me. Uh, so I was most proud about that. And I wanted to do that to make sure that we were educating people about the process and about what Juneteenth meant. And it's still a process, but Hey, it's, it was a great start. You know, I got a, um, cause I, I, don't, I don't know if you watch the podcast a lot. I would hope so. But anyways, um, I, I saw these, you know, little asides. So, sure. When uh, when George Floyd happened and Juneteenth um, was was starting to get enacted as uh, a recognized holiday, both locally and, and federally, um, it was a weird time, like you said, because there's a lot of stuff happening. People were like, oh, we'll give this many millions to this cause and, you know, a whole lot of diversity and inclusion uh, positions just started popping up at, uh, at companies and. Um, I know the company I'm at now, I, I, I wasn't with them at the time, but um, the CEO had, had encouraged people to take, we had volunteer hours, eight hours for a year, encouraged people to go out protest. This is like height of COVID, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, go, like it's, it's worth it. So a lot of people were exposed to, uh, to Juneteenth, sure. um, which who hadn't been exposed to it before. So I, <laughs> I have this friend. Uh, dad, I used to just like go watch uh, scary movies with because because Jessica won't go with me. Um, so we'll we'll kind of text each other every once in a while. So <laughs> he had a uh, Juneteenth that came around, and he had texted me Happy Juneteenth, <laughs> and I was like, "Thanks." Like I don't like I don't know how you supposed to respond, <laughs> right. but like, like hey, Happy Freedom Day. Like I I don't know, but 
it was cool that he was he was trying right and i think that that's that's what's important is that um like you said it was an opportunity for the community to kind of come together for everybody to be exposed um but then accept right and then start start that process of understanding like okay um how do i let somebody know that hey this is something that was really important to you a holiday that's really important to you and i understand that and i'm you know I'm, I'm accepting of it and kind of standing with you. So mm -hmm. I thought that was a really cool gesture and it was kind of like a microcosm of what I saw just in, in our friendship circle uh, in, our, in our community about that time. People were like really accepting of, of course you had people who were like, oh, but I mean, that's with anything, right? You're, you're never going to get a hundred percent, you know, popularity rate on, on anything. But um, I think at least in our circles, you know, a lot of people were overwhelmingly supportive of it. Um, and we're actually leaning into it, so I thought that that was cool. That's a good point you mentioned that because it is an opportunity to lean in because people didn't understand that we weren't free in July 4th, 1776. Right. Just let that just kind of breathe for a second. So Juneteenth is the day when we were all free, when everybody was free. So um, I think it's a great opportunity for people to lean in and really understand and to be educated about the whole process and what it means. Um, so the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863, you know, which brings up another point. I didn't even realize that and you may not either, but watch night service, it actually derived from, you know, our ancestors waiting to see if we were going to be freed on January 1st. So when we went to church on New Year's Eve, I had no idea that it derived from Freedom Day or the night in which we were waiting to see if we were going to be free. Did you know that? No, I thought it was because you needed God. You need to make sure God knew. Exactly, that. right? You have to have a good year. So. Exactly. So when I found somebody sent me that a couple of years ago, like I just freshly found out no, about this. this. Now, was this a meme or is this actually like this is a substantiated <laughs> yeah, this is facts. Yeah, these are facts. Yeah. Yeah, we there's a lot of memes floating around. No, I can, I can see the information. So, okay. yes. So, that was how that came about because if you didn't know that, you would think it was always about religion. Yeah. Because we went to church and, like you said, prayed in the new year. I'm like, well, that's not what it was. And I feel like if people understood what things are and what things meant, I feel like more of us would participate mm -hmm. because we just do stuff and have no idea about why we're doing it. And I feel like that's that's the part of the education piece I think that is missing with everything that we do. Mm. So that was one of the things that I'm proudest about. The other thing that um, one of my other initiatives was that I um, was able to have a conversation with our staff about a science center. So we have almost a Monroe Discovery Place here, which is literally right over there in the, um, across the street. So um, we have a lady here who is a, really a hidden figure from Monroe. Dr. Christine Mann Darden, who actually received one of the uh, Congressional Medals, Medals of Honor from the president at Sorry. the time. And so I spoke to them about us naming our science center in our honor. First of all, we didn't have any buildings named after any black women. Hmm. And so I thought that was an opportunity. And the other part to that is I felt like it could be a tourist attraction because everybody saw the hidden figure. And just from an educational component, I felt like it was important that we recognize somebody who has received the Congressional Medal of Honor from the president. If we have that lady who was from Monroe, she needs to be on the building here. Yeah. Right. And so. I had a conversation. Um, it got done. Not a, not quite the way I wanted it done, but her name is on that science center. So the name reads Monroe Science Center honoring Dr. Christine Darden. So mm. at least it's steps. So that that's that's another thing that, that happened that I'm most proud about. Um, so, you know, with those two things, um, I just wanted to be sure that the community understood what I was doing and why I was doing things because represent representation is really important. And I felt like if you don't have people to advocate for those things, then it's really hard for those things to happen. So coming back, what are you wanting to achieve? What, you know, what driving through the streets, talking to people, what are you like, you get reelected first meeting in like what's on your agenda that you feel needs to be like top priority. 
like my first 100 days, something like that. Uh, 30, 60, 90 plan. 30, 60, 90. So I want to make sure people understand my why. Like, I feel like sometimes people just feel like leaders or council members, they just do stuff. You know, I want people to understand that I am a country guy that's from here, grew up here, who loves my city. Um, you don't always have to agree with my politics or my policies, but do understand that I am trying to do the best that I can to make sure that Monroe is moving in the direction where it's appealing to all of all people that stay here. Um, and if you don't agree with the, my policies or the things that I stand for, then we can have a conversation. I want to be open enough to allow people to, to be able to call me. They have my cell phone numbers, my email address. Say, hey, Franco, hey, let's have a conversation about what you said in the meeting about X, Y, Z. And I want to be approachable in that regard so that people can understand that it's really not about the decision that's being made per se. It's more about connecting with the people so that they understand that, hey, I'm working for you. If you don't like what's happening, then we can have a conversation about that as well. But more or less, I really want to get people to know that I am willing to learn, listen, and lean in to obtain the perspective from the community and to leave from a vantage point of community first, more or less than what Franco's ideology is about where I see Monroe should be, but more or less, let me be the voice to, to come back to the table to say, Hey, this is what people feel like we need to do. How can we implement it? How can we implement that in the best way um, for our city? So you ran um, for the first time in 2017. Sure. You got, got elected. I remember that night you got elected. I saw all the uh, all the social media videos. Um, your campaign campaign manager went live and showed the whole the whole crew going wild. Yeah. It was it was nice. Um, in terms of two years, right? Four years. Four years. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. So you ran for re-election in 20... 2021. 2021. Mm -hmm. and you lost. Yep. Um, so you haven't been a councilman since then. And now you're right. running um, right. for, for a seat again. What, so two, two, uh, two prong question. What do you think? I don't, know, I don't know, you can't really pinpoint, but what do you think are some of the contributing factors as to why you weren't reelected the first time? And what have you learned in this, in this time that you haven't been in office that can better prepare you now that you're running for, for reelection again? Good question, Rush. Um, I really had to really figure out what does it mean to lose, right? Like, not necessarily pinpointing anything why I lost, but just really, I felt like I needed to do a lot of soul searching about losing. Like, what does that really mean? And um, so I sat in there for a few years, man, and just really kind of did some soul searching to kind of figure out, was it me? You know, was it people just didn't vote or did people just... Cause I feel like some people felt like I was a shoe in, right? And I talked to people, oh man, you're gonna get reelected, no problems. Like, not if you don't vote, mm -hmm. right? So, and that just became a reality. As I mentioned before, you know, the numbers are just staggering. But um, I don't know, man, I felt like people, um, I don't know why I lost, to be honest, Rush. But what I do know is that I wanted to make sure that I was to continue learner i want to i want to be a forever learner so what i did was i went and i did some leadership training which i've always done before my elections 2021 i went to the um carolina school of government um and i got a certification for um advanced leadership corps which was a rigorous training for about a week just learning about leadership on the governmental level um in July of this year, I did it again where there was a leadership conference in Ashburn through North Carolina Rural um, because I want to make sure that I'm always getting better as a leader. I don't feel like you can ever be, oh, I don't feel like you can ever know everything about leadership. I feel like there's always something that you can get better at. I feel like there's something that you can always obtain, maybe a nugget here that you can utilize in your leadership. But I really wanted to make sure that that my leadership was growing and that I was growing in my leadership. Um, so 
I really didn't know if I was going to run again, to be honest. And what kind of helped me to decide was when I won the season of the year um, award and I saw all the people that came to, to support me in that, that really was like, wow, these people, they really care. They paid to come see you too. They paid to come see me. And it wasn't no... No, it, it wasn't, wasn't no dropping the bucket. No, it, it wasn't that expensive. Stop rush. It was. It, it wasn't. It wasn't that much. Three hundred dollar plates. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it was. It was very cheap. <laughs> so, um, when that moment happened, it was kind of. It was. It was a. It was a sober moment for me because I saw all the people who supported me come out and kind of reassure to me that, hey, man, you are really doing big stuff. Because, you know, sometimes you won't really understand the magnitude of stuff that you're doing because I... I guess because I'm I'm really kind of in the weeds with everybody. I really have never stepped back and just kind of looked at what's happening. Um, but when the when you hear people saying the stuff that you've done and, and kind of celebrating that, it really kind of... It's it's really sobering to hear that, and so that was great. So the guest speaker, you know, he got up there and talked about it, and and kind of really challenged the people, like, hey, you know, this why isn't this guy still on council? Mm-hmm. And then so everybody was kind of like, I mean, he really charged them and really kind of held them accountable for not doing their part in voting. If it's not for me, go vote for somebody else so right. we can have representation because at this point. Um, we don't have anybody on council that looks like me, mm-hmm. and uh, and I'm I, and I and I would tell you this, man. Um, one of the seasons where I was kind of trying to figure out if I was going to do it again because it ain't got to be me. Right. I'm, I'm I'm not that guy that's power hungry and said, "Oh, I got to do this," but because of the people at that banquet, everybody said, "Hey, man, you need to run again. You need to run again." I was like, "You know what? Okay." But again. I will run, and I am running, but I need the people to show up, okay? I mean, because it's not cheap to run, first and foremost, um, and it's not easy. And so if if I'm going to be on the front toe in this line and, and, and leading, then at least you can do is just, like I said, go to the polls and check a box. And so... That's just that's just where it is for me, and so uh, I, I really try to make it as as normal and um, and as routine as possible, if you will, so that people can see it's re- it's it's not that big of a deal per se, but it really is when it, when we're talking about trying to change the trajectory of where we are to where I feel like we need to be. Uh, because there's so many things, as you said before, you don't know really what's happening in Monroe, but Monroe has a huge history of just systemic racism and things of that nature. And we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. And so we need to have people who's willing to do the work, who's willing to challenge that process to make sure that we are moving in that direction. Because, you know, if you're not moving that direction, then we're going to be moving backwards. And so we need people who are going to be leaders um, bold, courageous leaders who's going to really challenge the process and make sure that we are um, holding people accountable so that everybody has the freedoms and liberties that we deserve. You mentioned um, going to, was it the North Carolina School of Government? Mm-hmm. I did not know that that was an institution. And I always joke that politicians, like before you run for anything, you need to take like you need to go to some kind of school. Mm-hmm. So it's I, I think it's hilarious internally for me that you say it. I'm like, this place does exist. Yes, yes. You've, you've indicated her is what you've done. Yes. Well, I mean, it's at Chapel Hill. So, yes, it's one of their schools there. Um, and you're right. And that, and I love that program because they really like say it's a very rigorous program. And if every elected official went through that, we would be so different. So it's not mandatory. You volunteer. You yes, it's, it's, yes, it's voluntary, right? It, it, you, you're right. I would love for it to be mandatory that people go through this training so they can learn how to lead. Everybody, yeah. that's that's a deal, Jessica. People feel as though just because you're elected that you're a good leader, you're not a good leader <laughs> <laughs> unless you work on your leadership. Yeah. And that's kind of what I'm running on right now. I'm running on leadership because I feel like Beyond the parties, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, at the end of the day, can you lead? 
And so I am here to say that I can lead, right? And I feel like I'm I'm one of the better leaders because I understand, first of all, that I've worked for the city for 16 years. Mm-hmm. And I was a council member for four years. So I have 20 plus years of city of Monroe experience. And I feel like that piece plus my forward thinking equals leadership that you can trust. And so I feel like that's very important because people need to understand the dynamics of how all that plays together. Because a lot of times you have people that are elected have no idea about how the city is run. And then you have people on the other part of that that doesn't really know the policy piece of it. So I feel like I, I have a unique skill and where I've worked for the city for 16 years because I know the logistics of how they operate. So now I could be a better, better leader because now I'm helping to lead in that regard of to the people that are or have done the work or continue to do the work on the um, on the city side. So how do you get people out to check a box? Right. Like, how do you. Because you I remember you and I talked after you didn't win. Uh-huh. Um, and you, you spoke specifically to the turnout, um, how, how lesser it was than, than the, than the last time. So how do you get people out to vote when, as you, as you cited at the beginning, the turnout numbers were, were so low, especially for people who look like you and me, what are some of your strategies? <laughs> Well, that's like a million dollar question because, I mean, that's kind of what every elected official will want to know. But at the end of the day, my strategies have always been to be unique in my approach. You know, so I, I got some things kind of brewing. Um, like, for instance, just having a conversation here is, is, is one thing just to kind of be available to kind of have conversations to make myself a available and, and, and attend um, to try to show where people are. Um, get on social media, maybe do some videos on social media. Um, haven't really done that before, but just really trying to do some, some things differently, um, that I didn't do and to make sure that, that that's not going to be an excuse why I didn't win. Right. Mm. You know, I'm smart enough, not, well, I'm smart enough to know that yeah, you can't do the same thing and expect different results. Right. Um, so you have to do things differently and make sure that that those things are going to count. And so I've been doing that. And so I'm investing in some things, um, you know, trying to market myself differently. Um, but I'm going to show up as my authentic self, but still just want to make sure that that people see me, right? See Franco McGee for who I am, not formal council member, not whatever, but just to really kind of see me for who I am, somebody they can trust, somebody that they understands that believes in the city of Monroe, um, somebody that, you know, that understands the woes of households who may not be able to afford this and that, um, uh, some of the disenfranchised, um, you know, just really try to be in every corner to make sure that I am appealing to all people. So, because at the end of the day, everybody. I feel like, I feel like at the end of the day, man. Let's just let's just be real. I feel like in every city, everybody wants an opportunity to thrive. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, whatever, you want to be in a city that's thriving, that has availability, that has access, that has things that your family needs. And that's kind of always been the forefront of my leadership. I want to make sure that people have what they need to be successful. And people, whether it be businesses or your family, I want your family to be able to, if they want to go to a park, they could do that, take their kids out and, and feel safe and feel heard. Um, if you want to go and start a business, we have an opportunity for you to go get that information from the city. Um, economic development, all those things. I just want to be able to have those things available for anybody that wants to do that in Monroe. And sometimes it's been obstacles for people to be able to tame that. Um, so I want to make sure people understand that at the bare minimum, um, I care about the successes of families and and businesses in my in, in the community. And so, um, you know, because really, when you tear down the walls, I feel like everybody wants to be 
prosperous and and have these things where they feel like they're making a difference um whether you black white blue red or green i think all families want to be able to to thrive how does a citizen access you to let you know their Mm. concerns what they do or don't like what they want you to make changes on that's a good question so when i was on council um you know i our information is public record, so on our websites, that information was there. Um, and then social media. You know, I was really big on social media. I had Facebook pages, both personal and um, city council, so I did get a lot of interaction there. But, you know, <laughs> I found that sometimes people would rather just complain um, as opposed to having a conversation because it's easier, right? Because once you put it out there, you know, and then we have a discussion about how we can make those differences. And then now what are you going to do next? Are you going to go in and do what we talked about? Or are you just going to, you know, just right. stay in that place? So I feel like some people just want to just have something to say as opposed to really having a remedy of how we, how they can move forward and how I can support them in that, in that effort. So um, like I said, I just try to encourage people to try to do their part. And then if there's something that I can help politically or, or otherwise and I I would do that because there's been times when I have well several times when somebody's called me about a situation like somebody did call me about water fountains in the park which which was we didn't have any mm-hmm. so when I talked to the council I'm like yo man why we don't have any water fountains in the park so my the response that I got was that oh they always vandalize them I'm like so we will repair them. Right. So so we're going to jeopardize a situation where a child or somebody can have a heat stroke or whatever because we are afraid it's going to get vandalized. Man, that don't make no sense. So just kind of talking to people about some different perspectives about where somebody may deem something important, where this other person may not be important to them or it may not be important to them but she got some council members who actually get out and do things in life like myself mm. you have other people who go, go sit up in the house and don't do anything so that's not important to them or they don't understand what that means because they don't really interact in that space but because I do and I like to be outside and I feel like that's important so yes that's something that I can speak to and advocate for so that's why i feel like even in the mix of all that i feel like representation so you can have these different people that are represented so that everybody can understand and come together so i can give my perspective on an ideal you give your perspective on that ideal and then we get to like you know what i never thought about it that way and have grown conversations and try to come to a, a means of, of understanding now if i'm not mistaken being a council person is a full-time job but it's not Pay full time, so you will still have to work a full time job. Absolutely. How do you juggle that? Because, again, I I don't know exact salaries in terms of being, but I I know it's not right plentiful. So sure. for the most part, you're kind of volunteering um, in this role. So how do you juggle a full time job and then also working for the people? Yes. So the job there, so I'm a tutor as well. Um, I've been doing that for about seven years at actually elementary school where I attended at Benton Heights Elementary School, which is really a great opportunity for me to be in that space where the kids be a possibility model for the kiddos to kind of let them see in spite of whatever you're going through. A lot of them grew up where I grew up. Um, and that's my school is pretty much um, the enrollment is about 93 percent students of color. And so um, I wanted to be a representative to them so they can see somebody that looked like them who was doing stuff in the community and and making change and and, and making an impact. Um, But to your question, to to answer your point, to answer your question, I'm sorry. um, I I was lucky enough to have a job where I got off about two o'clock because I did have meetings that maybe would start at three thirty, four o'clock and things of that nature. So my job uh, my hours were from eight to two, and then I was able to go from there and then go on and do my city business stuff. So, but if I were to work a regular eight to five, it would be challenging to be able to do that. But um, I was able to kind of make that happen while being still working at the school and, and being on council. So that's a pay solo. Oh, why, excuse me. I'll rephrase. Why is it low enough that you need to work 
another job to make sure so we that- don't it's not a paid position oh so you're not you're mm-hmm. not paid well we get we get stipends okay and um but it's not like a paid position right so we get monies to be able to do some things to kind of help facilitate some of our duties and responsibilities but but we don't get a salary per se oh so you really are a volunteer pretty much mm. yeah. why why doesn't that role warrant being salary is i think that's just the way the government set up um is it just exclusive to monroe or no no that's that's yeah that's that's across the board. board yeah so most of these positions are volunteer you know they, they get paid a little bit but it's not anything that you can live off of. So you definitely have to have something else hmm. going on. So yeah. Interesting. So if y'all hiring, then um, <laughs> please, <laughs> please please help a brother out. The, the struggle is real. Um, I had a question, obviously, right? Because that's what you do in interviews. You ask questions. I don't know why I said that. But anyways, is leadership lonely? Is leadership lonely? Mm. I don't think so. I think leadership is, um, it's like if you do it the right way. So I, I consider myself to be a transformational leader. And what that means is you lead in a way to where you impact change systemically and with your followers or people that kind of follow you or that you're leading. So, I said all that to say that if I'm leading, for instance, if I'm leading you and Russ, then we're we're going to be in it together, right? Mm-hmm. Because the things that we're doing, it's going to impact what we do together. So it's not like transactional leadership where it would be where I do something to get that. You know, it's really more or less for a collective um, um, yield or 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 outcome for a group of people or an outcome or an entity. So in that sense, it's not lonely because I'm never by myself and how I lead because I'm really leading um, with the posture of making sure I'm doing it for the people that I'm leading. I guess, I guess why I ask is because like you have constituents that you represent, Mm -hmm. right? Um, If you make a decision, there may be some percentage that's really excited and another percentage that's like, well, why didn't you do it? Why didn't you put funds or resources toward mm-hmm. here? Right. There's decisions that you have to make that the people who you work for, right. Probably don't have to make, they don't have the weight of those sure. decisions to make. So, um, well, I guess, so when I met lonely is in terms of when it's not a situation where everybody's eating, right. A situation where it's like, you got a tough decision to make. Um, or you have a necessary decision to make and you know it's going to impact a certain amount of people positively and then maybe a small subset negatively. Uh-huh. Do those moments ever feel like lonely to you? Well, I mean, they have their gravity, yeah. but I really try to sit in the fact that I made the best decision at that particular time for the collective. Right. Right. Because I think what people miss when they're leading True leaders understand that you don't make a decision based on just what two people want to do. You make it for decision of the really the whole city. Mm-hmm. And even in the even in the folds of, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the the oil, so to speak. Because at the end of the day, we're still as great as our most poverty community, right? And so if you understand what that is and what that looks like, then if we need to throw money over here to make sure our city as a collective looks better, then we need to throw money over here. So if you're all the way over here and you're affluent and you you guys are eating over here, then you can't forget about the people that are not. And that's what I mean by leadership. True leadership cares about all people, not just the people who are thriving, but the people who aren't thriving. How do we get them to a level when we talk about equity, right? How do we get them to a level where these people are thriving? So true leaders understand what that looks like. And so when you communicate that to people, hopefully they'll understand why why you make some of the decisions that you make. Why you, we always do this when we turn look at each other at the same time. You have a question? Uh, I have a developing question. So we were, when we were driving in, Mm -hmm. um, David, there was a new community that had been built and then maybe not even half a mile. um, He had said, oh, they closed the food line. Uh, And I thought it was interesting that 
you know, a, and I don't know how long seventy five the food line <laughs> was closed. Um, but I thought it was interesting that there's a new community oh. and there's no what 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 I assume is would be the closest grocery store mm -hmm. isn't there. So is that something? And in Charlotte, we have a lot of conversations about you know, food deserts and stuff. Sure. So anytime like I notice a store is gone, I wonder. So I was curious if that's something that falls under you know your your scope of work. Would it be recognizing that hey, this area doesn't have a grocery store and what it what would be the process if that does fall under you of making sure that everyone does have access to food um as opposed to having to drive you know 10 minutes up the road 20 minutes up the road mm -hmm. to get to a grocery store yeah um so with that particular location the new one is right at, right up the street um where um Martin Luther King is you know the new food line is right there so really it just we really oh, okay. are about 30 about not even a minute up the street. Um, so that shopping center has been there for a while. And if, I, don't, I don't think, I'm not sure what's there now, but it's pretty desolate. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and even that area is not, it's not much happening for whatever reason. So um, hopefully that would be revitalized. Um, but to answer your question, that's really economic development. Okay. So we don't really get into that as much that's mainly the um staff that would kind of entertain those um issues and um make sure that we do bring in people to kind of fill those type of spaces and recruit entities to come in we do know that sometimes it's challenging to get people to come in because of the economic status of the space or the city like we were trying to get a Publix, but you know public say that we don't have the infrastructure or the monetary support to be able to, to oh, wow. have them to be able to come there. So they went to an entrail. Mm. So, which I've always thought those things was weird because I feel like if you build it, they will come Yes, and we are the county seat, but you know, they do look at the numbers. They do look at the, uh, the medians of people's incomes and their families and, which, again, I, I think that's a little bit of politics in that uh, because of the demographics in Monroe. Because I feel like the same way we drive the Publix to an in trail, they would drive to Monroe <laughs> if they wanted the Publix. So those type of things, they, they do happen a lot, you know, um, but I think that if we if we have people to fight for it, I think it could be more of a conversation because my thing, another part of it, I always think about when universities being this whole community of people that's just really not being accounted for. Mm. Um, and like I said, and I know for a fact that when I was here working for the city, like I heard the stories, oh, we never come to down. We didn't even know there was a downtown Monroe. And because I would go there and kind of ask, hey, what do you guys think about Monroe? You know, have you ever been? They had no idea we were even here because they were just on 74. They thought Monroe was 74, the corridor to Charlotte. That's, that's what I thought, too. And, and, and a lot of people feel the same way because they just don't turn up Maine and or take Skyway and come downtown and see what's happening. So it just takes time to kind of really get people to understand, like, the things that we have here and the things that we offer here and um, so that they can come and experience them too because we do have some things that are, that are going on um, here that's that's positive to be honest any questions we're about an hour so I figured I could um could wrap soon um, all right so you don't have to do this if you don't want to but to kind of put you on the spot you got a solo camera right over there I'm not right, but let's say I am someone who's going to be voting in the upcoming election. If you wanted to just look at the camera and tell me or someone out there who would see this, who's undecided or doesn't really know if it's necessary to vote, why they should vote for you. I won't afford you that opportunity or we can just stop, stop talking. Okay. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. No elevator pitch, you know, <laughs> okay. These okay. Well, you know, it's kind of a spot, but I see what I can do. Um, and you don't actually have to look at the camera if you don't want to. Okay, yeah, because that would be awkward. <laughs> you know, just, you know, just um, so, yeah, man, I, I just, like I said before, I really want people to know who I am as a person. I think, you know, 
when the lights are turned down and you leave the, the city hall and um, you go back to your home, I want people to see me as just a person. I, and, and I feel like sometimes people are misunderstood by kind of their, their policies that they may support because let's just be honest, man. I mean, we've all supported things that may not be what's right for me particularly. But when you think about as parents, you know, you make decisions for your kids, you know, or for the collective of your family. Like, you know, you probably want some Jordans, but you know, you may not be able to get those because of the, uh, cause I know you play ball, man. No, I never actually just I was say, have you ever, no, I've never really been in the Jordans. Yeah. With sneakers. But, but, Point taken on sneakers. So I feel like if people kind of understood how what that looks like and what that means, um, from my perspective, just taking politics off the table, just why, why I am I am, you know, because I want people to to know that I make decisions and I want people to know that I am here to work for you. Um, and then if you don't like something that I said or you don't like a policy that I approve. Then let's have a conversation about that. And don't be so nitpicky about, oh, you said this over here, you said this over here. Look at me as a collective, as a whole person, um, to be able to make a decision that's going to be best for the city. But knowing that I'm going to do what's respectable, um, I'm going to do things that I feel like I lead with integrity, um, you know, and I'm never going to be compromised in who I am as a person, whether it be, you know, I'm a Christian first, you know, I, I, um, I love my city. And so when I make decisions, I'm thinking about those things that's going to reflect my family, right? Uh, that's going to reflect who I am. Um, that's going to reflect my faith. Um, but just know that, I'm making a decision or I'm going to be leading from a vantage point of, um, from a collective kind of vantage point. Um, and so I guess I'm, I don't, don't mean to ramble, but I guess my point is I want to look at, I want people to see me as a leader who is just leading as the best person that I can be. Right. And not necessarily from any political vantage point, but just trying to lead just from just being Franco and, and understanding my hometown and what those needs are and making sure that families can have a safe space to be um, prosperous and successful. So that's it. That's pretty good. All right, I might vote for you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Yeah, Councilman, we won't speak into existence. Uh, where can people find you online? I'm online. So uh, I'm at Franco for Monroe on Facebook and on Instagram. Um, and Franco McGee on Facebook. So I'm there. Uh, come check me out. Okay. You said you're going to start doing some like some of them cheesy political yeah, videos. Yeah, yeah. You should just do the TikTok dance. Yeah, I think I'm going to do TikTok dances. Yeah, I thought about some TikTok. Is that a thing? Just find those trending dances. Yeah, it's trending because it's out there. So. I do have something that's coming up though. Tomorrow I'm, I got a billboard going up, so that should be nice. Billboard, yes. Yeah. Big money. Okay. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Right. Or can you not? Is that part of the surprise? Yeah, it's kind of part of the surprise, but uh, well, this won't run until after it's. Yeah, so it's going to be on 74. Uh -huh. um, on LaSalle, um, then I'm gonna do one for, um, kind of four weeks out from the election. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna do a digital billboard there. Nice. And um, just trying to say, you're trying to. Hey, got, got, you got to talking about he. He don't need no. He don't need to get paid. I'm gonna be a tutor. Cause clearly you got some. Well, no, that's what I was gonna ask you for a, a contribution too. <laughs> since uh, you don't need it, clearly yeah, you got yeah. digital. No, 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 I do need it. Uh, I sure do. So yes. Um, yeah, so I'm actually looking for contributions and donations for my campaign as well. So, hey, if, if anybody's out there who wants to do that, hey, that information is there available as well. Is that on your, is that information on your social media yeah, too? it's on my social media too. Okay. Yeah. Do you have an official website or just, or are you just running it's it through social media? Because I've learned, to be honest, that people actually go it's there more or less than the webpage. I, I had both at one point, but when I looked at the viewership, it wasn't it yeah. doesn't more because you can you know you can do more interaction stuff on social media and as opposed to the website so okay yeah, yeah we, might, we might be able to slide them a couple, so, couple couple dollars i appreciate you can't that. vote so the least we could do hey, well like we said we can't vote we can't even vote in our own city just because of where we live yeah we're like 
There's like all of these counts, all of these uh, zip codes that can vote, yeah. like surround us, but we're the one zip code or like, oh, line wow. where we can't vote in the city. It's funny. I was just thinking. I was like, hmm, what if I ever ran for council? I felt like someone would be like, she can't even vote for council. <laughs> she can't even vote. Like, why are you running? You can't. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. I can. Well, at least you know you got one vote. Hey, one vote. That's the start. Somebody right? gonna vote for hey, you. Know? You know. Um, <laughs> yeah, but no. Um. I think we're good. I, this was cool. Thanks for agreeing to uh, to sit down with us. Um, I know we've been trying to do thank it. Thank y'all for the opportunity. Yeah, we've been trying to do it for a while. Um, and I wanted to make sure we got it done this cycle because we were supposed to do it last time and it didn't it didn't work out. So yep, um, we'll have to schedule for sure. the win. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh for sure, that'd be great. You know, we wanted to do it at at the main spot, but you know, we downsized recently, so it wasn't a whole lot okay. of space. Like we all would have been on the couch together, like. You would have been right here and Jess would have been over here. So I just wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been. I do. Yeah, so okay. close, you know, it was fun. This was yeah, on location and, and, um, you know, thanks to, uh, you know, the people who opened up, opened up their spot to us. Yeah. It's pays to have connections. Sure. So absolutely. Um, anything? No. Cool. So, uh, I can't, oh, I'm over here. So, uh, anyone who, uh, found us either via Franco, um, just YouTube algorithm, internet, whatever, uh, if you'd like what you saw, maybe we can do some more. Um, not not political per se interviews, but more so in this space. Uh, this was really cool. Uh, be sure to hit the like, subscribe button. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Apple, Spotify. Tuned in. Tune in. Tune in. Is it not tuned in? It's tuned. It's tuned. Tune in. It's tuned. Tune in. It's not tuned. To you, any? I'm doing that thing. Black people do it. And... <laughs> I'm trying not to do. It. All right, tune in. Um, and Google. So uh, be sure to hit us up if you don't like the the video and you want to listen to us. You can put us on and while you're driving back to work, since businesses are making everybody come back to the office, All right? Or if uh, you know you just want to put us on while you're doing work at the house, uh, we really appreciate it. Um, other than that, I think we're uh, that's a wrap for us. So Franco, thanks again. Appreciate My you. Pleasure. Love you. Thank you guys. Absolutely. That's us for this week. We'll be back next week. We out. Peace. Yeah. None but some grow pains. Yeah. Hey. Hey. I done came way too far. Can't stop me now. I done came way too far. Can't stop me now. I done came way too far. Can't stop me now. I done came way too far. Can't stop me now. Can't stop me now. Can't stop me now. Yeah. I done came way too far. Can't stop me now.